This is Masters in Business with Barry Ritholtz on Bloomberg Radio. This week on the podcast, I have an extra special guest. Matthew Chabron is the co-founder of TKO Capital, a Paris-based alternative asset manager. They run over $40 billion worth of assets. I found this to be really a fascinating conversation about approaching the world of investing from a different angle, being creative, thinking out of the box, looking to not just imitate what other people do, but create new opportunities by just thinking about the world differently. The conversation was really informative and quite fascinating. I thought it was great, and I think you will also, with no further ado, my conversation with TKO Capital's Matthew Chevron. Thank you, Barry. I forgot to mention, you have received the Chevalier de l'Ordre de la Légion d'Anna by the President of the French Republic in January 2022. We'll, we'll circle back to that at some other point. I don't, I don't know how relevant that is to asset management, but let's talk a little bit about what you were doing before you were being lauded by the French president. You went to school in Paris, but you began your career in London at Merrill and Deutsche Bank. Tell us a little bit about that background. Yeah, no, that's right, Barry. You know, it's uh, that's one thing, you know, in, in Europe where um, London was and actually think still remain you know the one place where you know you want to get exposure when you join financial services mm-hmm. so uh i was lucky to get this uh summer internship at merrill lynch back in the late 90s um i met antoine effectively my co-founding partner so that was you know a while back but nonetheless you know i don't know if it was love at first sight but uh <laughs> we got to uh get along you know pretty well and after uh, you know a few years working for investment banks uh, he then joined Goldman Sachs. I joined effectively Deutsche Bank. We decided, you know, to try to uh, have a go on our own. Uh, we were 28, 30, respectively. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, looking backwards, as much as investment banking, even with banks that have, are no longer there, mm-hmm. uh, uh, was a great, you know, that, that was a great uh, training. I think it was a great training. I think, you know, we learned a lot. Uh, the exposure, you know, you get. Um, in investment banking. I was a leveraged finance banker by background. Mm-hmm. Um, and so late 90s, that the emergence of the uh, high yield market in Europe, you would print deals, you know, like uh, never before. You get this exposure, you're a young analyst, associate, you get to go on the roadshow with management teams. You know, I look backwards, that was a hell of a training, you know, in terms of uh, the exposure you're yeah, getting. Yeah, I can imagine. Was the plan when you were going to school in Paris always to go into finance or... Were you originally leaning another direction? You know, prior to uh, uh, joining a business school in Paris, I studied political sciences in my native Provence, you know, in Mm Aix-en-Provence. And uh, there was no hint at the time, you know, that I would be heading into into finance. Um, And so when I then got the exposure and getting to learn with uh, great teachers, by the way, uh, what, and again, we're back in, you know, in the late 90s, but then you start reading books, uh, and I'm not talking about the theoretical books, but, you know, some uh, uh, experience, you know, the people. I remember these books, you know, reading the, uh, uh, you know, uh, Liar's Poker from uh, mm-hmm. Michael Lewis, you know, reading uh, Predator's Ball, you know, about the, the milk and the junk bone, and uh, that's where, you know, the excitement started, you know, like, you know, I have to get exposure to that. So, uh, no, there was nothing written, but uh, it was a great step. So, fast forward to today, you now work in a large European firm in the USA, but really you began your career at big American firms in London. That's right. What are the cultural differences like uh, a U.S. firm in Europe versus a European firm in the U.S.? Yeah, well, it's an interesting interesting question. Um, Looking from the U.S., Barry, you know, at times, you know, Europe, you know, may may be an easy concept, but it's a very complex reality. Mm -hmm. And so doing business in Europe is obviously, you know, uh, it's all about being local because Italy is not Spain, France is not, you know, Germany. You know, at times people in London think that they cover, you know, the whole uh, uh, European play field. But again, it's a complex reality. So having met people back then, you know, Americans working for, 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 for these U.S. banks, you know, now they understand that. And the one successful, and even some of our, you know, peers, competitors, friends, uh, American franchise who are... Uh, um, uh, competing and tackling the European market, 
very often the ones successful, the one very successful, are the ones who've been you know spending a lot of time you know on the ground. And then on the contrary, hopefully, having worked for U.S. franchise, having spent time with the uh, people and great mentors, you know, for me, I now can hopefully understand better, you know, the cultural difference, you know, as as we expand here. And um, as I'm sure you know, you would appreciate, you know, being here in New York is a very different reality than the rest of the uh, the Americas. Uh, uh, partly when it comes down to uh, visiting new clients, you know, in the Midwest, you know, there are, uh, you know, the part, you know, of the uh, of the U.S. So hopefully there's a bit of convergence here, you know, to make it uh, worthwhile. I love the old Spalding Gray quote. I don't live in America. I live in a small island off the east coast of America. Because to your point, New York is in Kansas City and Kansas City is not Miami. But New York is definitely its own creature. It is for sure. And, uh, you know, for us at TKO, it's been a, an important step to uh, uh, to open and expand here in North America. You know, just by background, Barry, when I, when I moved here five years ago, uh, uh, this year, in 2018, you know, we, we had barely no uh, uh, relationship in North America. We had made, you know, a few, few investments, relationship from a, from a client standpoint, I mean, from an LP standpoint. Um, and, and fast forward, you know, today is close to 10% of our uh, AUM that we have raised here. You know, we launched new initiatives. We try, you know, to be differentiating. And obviously, it's a long-term game, and you have to be definitely long long-term greedy mm-hmm. when you uh, when you set up a business you know in the uh, 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 in the US but in the business we're in today in the alternative asset management p- space uh, as competitive it can be but you know the, the structural opportunity now is such that the commitment uh, as a European that you have to make here has to be long term I made the commitment you know personally and I can see the path you know because there is room to uh, expand the business so let's talk about what led to the decision to launch TKO capital Back in 2004, you're at Deutsche Bank. Your colleague Antoine is at Goldman Sachs. What made you say, hey, let's get the band back together again? Well, you know what? It's actually back to what I was you know, just saying. We were watching all these franchise being launched. And obviously at the top of them, you know, all the ones you can think of who are you know, leading the industry today. But back then, they were you know, managing a you know, few uh, tens of billions of dollars, which was you know, uh, uh, enormous back then, but it's only a fraction of what they are today. And we were seeing all these American franchise, you know, launching in um, uh, in Europe, you know, out of London. And we're like, you know, why don't we give it a go? I mean, we learned leverage finance. We learned, you know, real estate debt. We knew high yield. We knew, you know, uh, opportunistic investment. Uh, and we're like, it's never too late. It's never too early. Mm-hmm. And we decided to go with, you know, a huge 4 million AUM that we had gathered from friends and family. Right. So you can appreciate, you know, the challenge back then, but you have to start somewhere. Right. That that's walking around cash back back then. So let's talk about not too late, not too early. You launch right after the dot com implosion. Correct. Uh, but a few years before the great financial crisis. That's right. What was that period like? What was that lull like between those two giant volatility events? Um. It was an experience because, you know, the dot-com uh, bubble, I remember being a young associate at Merrill Lynch, and all the investment banks, they had to reinvent themselves, you know, mm-hmm. to make sure they could re- you know, remember this retained talent, you know, that we've been hearing, you know, lately again, you know. And uh, so they were creating some cool working space and uh, you would no longer, you know, wear a tie and all that, which was all form of a substance and as if there was a shift. And then you have this ramp up from effectively 04 when we launched to the GFC, um, and we're three years, four years into business, you know, at TKO. And I remember, you know, we feel extremely proud because then we were banking, you know, with Beer Stearns, we were banking with Lehman Brothers. And that was, you know, a step in the entrepreneurial development. Mm-hmm. And then all of a sudden, over the weekend, those banks are gone. And so you're like a young entrepreneur living this near death experience, uh, uh, despite thinking that you were close to certainty because you were working with the best institution and counterparty you can think of. And then all of a sudden, it's all about how you see and look at the world. Never take anything for granted. Always be, you know, in the world of challenging everything. So it, it's not good for your uh, stomach pain, you know, every morning, but only the paranoid survive. And I think that was a great learning experience. So let's talk about what took place post Bear Stearns and post Lehman. From a business perspective, Bear Stearns gets absorbed into J.P. Morgan Chase. So you're contacts at Bear Stearns are still in business. 
the best parts of Lehman Brother get absorbed into Barclay. So I got to imagine a lot of the folks you were doing business with at those places landed on their feet and you still had some relationship? Or am I being uh, too sanguine about it? No, no. We're, there was a bit of, uh, bit of uh, all of the above. But more importantly for us, you know, in our you know, development, as I said, it, it was about, you know, never taking anything for granting and granted because you know Lehman Brothers is what a single A rated bank on the Friday night and it's defaulted you know on the Monday morning and and, and even if I'm sketching a bit you know from there on at the time we're 800 million AUM I guess mm -hmm. uh, we have a team of 20 25 people most of them still being with us today by the way mm -hmm. uh, and it's great when you've been to war together if you if you allow me uh, because then, you know, you just have to look at someone in the eyes and you know exactly how they're going to behave because we've been through that, you know, together. And so for us, you know, beyond the people and beyond the institution, it was the beginning of a second phase of the journey. Um, I like to say maybe not less naive about, you know, how easy all these things are because they're not easy. Steve Schwartzman wrote his book. It's called What It Takes, you know. And so for us, that was everything was being equal. The beginning of the second phase of the journey where it was no longer the teasing part. You were effectively like into the real stuff. Now, on the positive and the silver lining was that this whole situation started, you know, putting a lot of light on, let's say, the alternative market. Private debt, private credit was unheard of in Europe until the banks effectively went into this massive liquidity uh, uh, squeeze and all those asset managers had to, you know, step in and fill this void. Great opportunity for us. Private equity at the time was only about buyout and LBO. Mm -hmm. Only few had heard about, you know, the growth equity part where you need to uh, strengthen an entrepreneur or company's, you know, balance sheet because he's not, you know, or she's not trying to sell uh, the business. It's just about, you know, making sure you find the right partners, you know, to strengthen the balance sheet. And so, so on and so forth. You, you know, we started a new period adding on top of that, you know, this uh, very accommodating monetary policy where that was the beginning of a new chapter for private markets. And we were lucky, you know, to effectively embark on this journey at this time. So let me follow up on the financial crisis, the period afterwards. Clearly, it was highly disruptive, lots of damage done, lots of people lost their jobs, lots of businesses went out. But it sounds like a lot of opportunities were created in what came after. It was uh, certainly the case for us. Again, you know, many challenges, but uh, with the uh, hard work and with people who uh, could see, you know, the opportunity and uh, uh, possibly, you know, with a, with a European approach, thinking that, yes, you can develop uh, um, a very multi-local footprint organization in Europe, be uh, an alternative to global investors, to uh, clients, um, to the to to the one established, you know, mainly you know, mainly Americans, you know, I must admit, uh, that was very exciting. You know, it was very exciting to get into that, and to a certain extent, you know, uh, we had been looking forward for the day where we could face another of those crises, and we all know they're all different, but better prepared, better prepared, you know, with more resources, with a more powerful platform, with a bigger footprint. And uh, leaving, you know, COVID aside, leaving, you know, I don't know, Brexit aside, leaving all these uh, little steps over the past 10 years, 12 years, uh, uh, we've been, you know, getting better prepared, you know, for when the cycle change. And we may have entered, you know, this new, uh, this new chapter, this new cycle, raising interest rates, it started, you know, a year ago, we're of the view that it's, no, it's not getting, you know, lower anytime soon. And so we go back to the basics of what's, our job should be risk underwriting, risk assessment, uh, uh, asset prices are different from asset valuation. I mean, the valuation is the future uh, uh, cash flow uh, discounted at a risk-free rate plus a risk premium. Well, guess what? The risk-free rate now is 5%, it's no longer zero, and the risk premium is closer to 5% than it is from two. And so all of a sudden, the whole merits of our job uh, uh, gets back you know, into the, the, the center of the pitch and that makes our job much more exciting. You know, we've never been, you know, more excited than we've been for the past 12 months to invest today. So let's talk about what brought TKO to the U.S. Uh, clearly, you guys were very successful in Europe. You now have 13 offices around the world. Uh, is it just the size of the U.S. market? What was the attraction here? 
Well, I mean, size is is, is definitely you know a reason, but uh, I would add uh, we had just gone public at the time, you know, 2017, and for us the listing uh, maybe way before it became more uh, uh, spread, you know, in the recent years was um, the, the the main objective of the listing Barry was really to uh, promote the brand, the franchise. Um, we never sold a single share, you know, on the occasion of. You this guys listing. only allowed a small piece to go public, right? Yeah, that, 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 that's right. And all our historical backers, uh, uh, shareholders, they actually, you know, kept on uh, supporting the business. You know, we uh, we tapped the ECM market twice, and they all, you mm-hmm. know, reinforced their ownership. So, uh, unlike many IPOs, which are a way, you know, to monetize the business, for us, it was about really about rationalizing the platform. We had just come out of uh, 13, 14 years of very entrepreneurial development during a period, as you mentioned, which was pretty bumpy. And so it was a great way to rationalize the platform, come with one brand, one name, getting getting the name out there. So that was in 2017, we went public on Euronext Paris. Um, and coming to the US was, uh, there, there was no other alternative than coming to the US you know, at some point. And we thought the timing was right both because we had now, we, we had then, you know, 20 billion AUM. We'd been in uh, in Asia for a uh, uh, for few years, and it had been extremely promising. And so I decided, you know, to come here, you know, to promote this brand, to convert it into a commercial relationship, raising more capital towards U.S. investors, which, to your point, is one of the deepest uh, market in the world. And then also, you know, start deploying capital here in the U.S. Not that there is a shortage of capital, you know, right. uh, uh, by no means, but as we like to say at TK, you know, create, not compete. And so uh, we started initiative like secondary private credit, you know. Mm-hmm. Uh, private debt was a mainstream uh, developed strategy here, I mean globally and here in the US. I think we were one of the first one to move into secondary private credit, you know. Fast forward a couple of years, three years, now we can demonstrate the merits of the strategy, the track record of the strategy. Uh, we started expanding into uh, mid-market infrastructure. That was uh, right before the, uh, uh, you know, the Biden election and all the focus, you know, on infrastructure when we were not active in infrastructure, you know, in Europe. So we tried to find some play that could differentiate ourselves, not only vis-a-vis our, you know, European and Asian investors, but also here in the U.S. to be able to tell a different story to LPs with one key differentiating factor is the skin in the game that we have, you know, as a structure and as founders into the organization. So a lot of companies that go public then have a valuable currency they can use for acquisitions. How did that play into the thinking? Yeah, that's right. And we, um, you know, we used that a couple of times very selectively uh, since going uh, uh, public. Infra was, you know, was was one of them. Uh, another one in uh, uh, real estate, you know, in Europe. And uh, I mean, acqu- they, they were very uh, selective bolt on acquisition. You know, an acquisition in, uh, in our businesses is always a big bet, right? It's, mm-hmm. uh, we're in the people business. Um, and you need the chemistry. I mean, you need the culture, you know, to uh, to work out. Um, but you know, looking forward, it's certainly you know we're in better position today to consider acquisition than we were in a few years ago. So as the market and the industry restructure, you know, we'll certainly be uh, very uh, uh, very opportunistic. That's kind of interesting. The thought of bolt on as opposed to within the same space. There's a long history of financial acquisitions that didn't really work out all that well because of the chemistry, That's because right. of the cultural issues. But something you said earlier really stood out to me. You want to create, not compete. So let's talk a little bit about how you guys at TKO think differently. Tell us, or in, in Steve Jobs' term, think different. Tell us how you approach the world differently than a lot of your competitors. Yeah. Um, you know, when we started, as I told you, extremely, uh, a, a, extremely modest. There were plenty of franchises out there. When you know, even if you talk to private investors, uh, high net worth, family offices, who can be a bit more nimble in the way you know they approach their asset allocation, they need to see uh, a reason why they would go. You know, with uh, what was back then a TK who more than a TKO. You mm-hmm. know, uh, uh, <laughs> and find you know, and and find a reason why you know they would allocate there. Back then, you know, in Europe, back in the day, when we start doing, you know, private credit, direct lending, today is very much mainstream. I can tell you that that, that mm-hmm. back then it was not. Uh, you know, at the time, they even called it shadow banking, you know, in Europe. It's yes. been quite a while since, you know, I last read about shadow banking because it's become so mainstream and structural, you know, today that it's really part of the... Uh, so we've always tried to effectively be... Um, 
a little bit, I, I, you know, I don't know how it comes across. And he, it's not the underdog, but, you know, coming with something that is different. So that Clean you can, slate? Yeah, so that you can make, you know, a, a, a name for yourself and then, you know, use these adjacencies of the business then to scale and make them, you know, very mainstream. As I was saying, the secondary private credit that we launched a couple of uh, years ago now here in uh, in New York is becoming a bit more mainstream. Every day I would see one of the large bulge bracket banks, you know, launching or speaking about the initiative. We're like, well, maybe that was a good idea we had. And competition is good, by the way. You know, no, nothing wrong about competition, but at least you've established, you know, a name for yourself and obviously you got the track record and you can, you know, you can showcase that. So that's step one. The second thing, um, Barry, if I may, is, you know, in our industry, what should make the biggest difference is the skin in the game that the managers, you know, put into their business. Mm-hmm. I like to say that in our industry, you come across a lot of people who are willing to make money with someone else's money. Mm-hmm. You come across less people willing to make some money with their kids' money. Any entrepreneur, you know, is 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 you know is taking risks by you know. You know borrowing some capital and investing into his business, you know, whatever the business is. You know. mm-hmm. And in our industry at times, I think that there's been a little bit of um, irony, not to say hypocrisy, in the way that we showcase the skin in the game. I don't think carried interest is a great alignment of interest. The only alignment of interest is the amount of capital that any given manager or firm is putting into uh, uh, into its fund. You know, when, when you read that okay, well, you know, we put, you know, uh, 1% of the fund, you know, as commitment from the GP. The fund is a billion, you know, we put 10 million, it's a lot of money. Yes, but you're charging 2% for the next 10 years. So the option cost is not that high. Mm -hmm. When you're putting 10%, 20% of your balance sheet capital side by side with your LP, you can do a basic Excel spreadsheet and you'll see, you know, what is at stake. And that effectively, yes, you're going to make some money on the management fees, on the performance fees, or the carried interest. But you know what you have at stake, side by side with your client, is a totally different magnitude. And I think this is where the industry should be uh, heading. And uh, many of our, uh, uh, you know, peers, competitors, they all have you know different models. But the one with significant skin in the game, from the GP, from the partners, from the balance sheet, and going public. Well, by the way, Barry was a great way for us to strengthen this equity base, which is, you know, partners own and control and management uh, uh, own to effectively create what has been so far, certainly in Europe, a second to none uh, skin in the game model. I like the way that sounds. Let's talk a little bit about Europe. If we look at the past few decades, Europe outperformed the U.S. in the 2000s while we were going through dot com and financial crisis. In the 2010s, the U.S. markets were just on fire and really did very well. 2020s, things started out a little shaky. How do you compare uh, the investment environment in Europe over the past few decades versus the U.S.? Well, both of them were obviously driven by uh, interest rates, and they moved you know, uh, uh, the same direction, but in different patterns. And when we first got into negative interest rates uh, in Europe, few years ago on the back of the uh, euro crisis, you know, mm-hmm. imposed the GFC, first with the sovereigns, but then, you know, with the IG market, with the investment grade market, right. you had corporates basically borrowing, you know, 100 and being asked, you know, to give back 98. And today, you know, when you look backwards and with no back trading, you're like, you know, okay, what, you know, what were we thinking about, you know, back then? Because for what we do, and I mean, you know, the business, Barry, like, uh, risk underwriting is about effectively scaling the risk, you know, the return. And we were in a very uh, awkward environment. And so that's why I was surprised to see so many people surprised, um, you know, a year ago, May 22, you know, interest rates started rising and all of a sudden the whole software were uh, bugged. Mm-hmm. I mean, what we do is not rocket science and it all comes down to the you know, value of liquidity and the cost of credit. And then we can start, you know, doing what we are supposed to be doing, you know, risk underwriting. And so Europe, US went into a different pattern on the way down and very different on the way up. I mean, here in the US, obviously, you were uh, uh, much more reactive, you know, in raising uh, uh, rates, rightly so in my view. Mm -hmm. Maybe Europe is lagging a bit that time around, Hmm. you know. Uh, They were actually faster at... 
uh, uh, reducing interest rates, even so into negative territory. Um, but uh, th there is a little bit of decoupling, you know, going on right now. And, and for us, it's a great way, particularly, you know, at TKO, where we are, you know, uh, we are very exposed to the yield play, credit, mm -hmm. infra, real estate, bespoke credit. And so uh, all, all that's all the, the starting point of this risk um, underwriting. So let's talk a little bit about the difference between the 2010s and the 2020s, starting with, hey, it's pretty arguable that by the time the Fed began raising rates here in the United States, they were already behind the curve. Uh, their 2% target had been hit a year earlier, and CPI kept going higher. So if the Fed was behind the curve, how much further behind the curve are the central banks in Europe in terms of dealing with their inflation issues? The um, you know central banks in the U.S. and in Europe they may have a different mandate. You know, one might be more political, you know, than the others. And at times, you know, when you have to effectively finance, you know, all the the, the, the deficits, you know, you have to be mindful that uh, uh, you need to be able, you know, to issue, you know, to issue and and, and you know, pay down this uh, this debt. Um, I think that you know uh, right now, and without getting into too many you know political details, I mean, Europe is probably is not in a good place relative to where they were in reacting to um, COVID, for example, or reacting to uh, uh, the Euro crisis, uh, you know, t 10 years ago. I mean, the, the political situation in Europe has created indirectly some uh, some effect maybe on the, uh, uh, on the ECB and as much, you know, uh, uh, I mean, Christine Lagarde has been doing a, a terrific job uh, uh, after, you know, Mario Draghi, you know, there. But the uh, the institution, you know, maybe should be uh, a bit uh, 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 bolder, you know, in the way uh, you're tackling, you know, this uh, this inflation issue. Because we all know that um, period of uh, very low interest rates create massive inequality. Inequality, you know, between people having access to credit and the people who don't have access to credit. And when mm -hmm. I say people, it's individual, it's corporate, it's uh, states. And so, ironically, you know, you save a system but you make it a bit more unequal in the way people you know, came out of this uh, period. So that's really interesting. During the post-financial crisis era of very low rates, anything priced in credit, real estate, equities, bonds, did really well. Certainly that helps the top 10% in the United States. During COVID, rather than just a monetary response, we saw a massive fiscal response, which seemed to have really helped across the entire economic strata, especially the middle class. So what do our experiences post-financial crisis, post-COVID, tell us about the need for balance between monetary and fiscal stimulus? Yeah, you're absolutely right. But by the same token, we know that right now, I mean, you know, I'm not an economist, but it, you know, in the US, in Europe, you know, the inflation, the structural inflation, people might have you know, a different view about that, mm -hmm. is certainly hurting, you know, uh, uh, the the one with the less you know uh, uh, right. resources you know obviously um, food uh, energy housing uh, I'm not even talking about you know uh, uh, school healthcare and obviously you know, in Europe we have a totally different uh, right. different you know environment and um, about this uh, this matter so uh, it's a it's a tricky uh, uh, situation and where I think asset managers have a role to play is in making sure that whenever someone is saving a dollar or investing a billion dollar, you know, be a private investor or large institutional investors, is that there is the appropriate risk return associated with the strategy that is being implemented. That was very complicated to do in, a, in the zero uh, interest rates mm -hmm. environment because everyone threw the dice and it was a double six. Because you can only make it right when money is free. Because right. when money is free, investment has no merits. You know? And um, now that we are in a situation where money has some value, then you can be discriminating. And that should benefit, again, the one individual saving a dollar or the one institutional investing a billion. Um, and, and that, in that respect, regardless of this macro situation, if I can come back to our role as asset managers, that's where we have a role to play. So let's talk a little bit about valuations relative to risk and reward. Uh, arguably, the United States, uh, both the public markets and the private markets are not cheap today. Uh, they're not crazy dot-com expensive, but they're certainly not inexpensive. 
How does Europe and the rest of the world compare on a valuation basis to the U.S.? Um, maybe because I come from a leveraged finance background, as I as I told you, I tend always to focus on the downside. Mm-hmm. Um, but I also learned uh, uh, along the way that you rarely die. I mean, as a company, from your uh, uh, from your P and L or from your assets, but you always die from your liabilities. Mm-hmm. And I think that effectively, this um, uh, excess in very cheap money, uh, this excess in leverage. The success in um, uh, thinking that you could access unlimited for an indefinite period of time of cheap to free capital may have created some uh, the wrong asset allocation uh, pattern, you know, uh, in, in some places. So I think we've now entered a period where we have to swallow this whole mispriced, overlevered assets out there. Mm-hmm. Corporate credit was one, you know, obviously the uh, the bonds, I mean, the sovereign bond market, and we remember the SVB story. It's about, mm-hmm. you know, T-bills. And then you, you uh, obviously, the real estate, you know, ma- many areas that were over-levered at the wrong uh, cost. And that could be painful uh, uh, because someone will have to take the pain, even if, you know, unlike 2008, where the risk was concentrated, you know, uh, on banks' balance sheet, today is much more spread across, uh, uh, let's say, you know, asset managers. But you have to find a way to dry up all this excess of liquidity, which was necessary on the one hand, but maybe mispriced on the other hand. Um, And so today, I think that part of the IG fixed rate corporate bond market Obviously, you know, part of the uh, uh, real estate and, you know, we've been talking uh, uh, at length about that. Uh, we'll have to uh, to uh, suffer some of the pain or, or, or losses in some way, shape or form. As always, on the other side of this trade, that will create, you know, great opportunities for people liquid, nimble, who don't have to carry uh, 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 aged, you know, inventories, you know, if I, um, uh, if I may say. Um I have the impression that the U.S. will be uh, um, um, more um, uh, realistic in the way they approach that. You know, in terms of you know taking the heat, taking the pain, and starting again. Um, I- in Europe, maybe there's a little bit of a pretend and extend game, mm-hmm. but it's always better, you know, to uh, you know what has to be done. Uh, ultimately, you know, should be done immediately. As, Tear the uh, Band-Aid off, don't, as, don't wait. A, a, exactly, and uh, that's what we should do when it comes to financial risk and financial so, pricing. So you mentioned the excess liquidity is causing um, excesses and, and dislocations. Have higher Fed rates and other around the world, higher interest rates, taken some of that out of the system? And combined, what is the impact of the regional banks that have gone belly up, a handful of them, but it certainly has put the fear of God into a lot of small banking shops. What does that do to all the excess liquidity that's out yeah. there? Uh, you know, on the regional bank, I'd rather not not comment. I'm not an expert, and it came, you know, as effective as a surprise how quickly large, very large institution, you know, could uh, get into some liquidity uh, liquidity stress. Uh, coming back to my comment again, you know, it's your liability side. You know? mm-hmm. um, uh, and there's been you know, plenty of comment there. Uh, what I see is that, once again, for asset managers, it's a very interesting structural opportunity because it creates a bit of void you know, in terms of uh, the market that uh, we can fill in in some way, shape, or form. So um, I think that on the positive side, um, investors, allocators, today they can effectively allocate capital into strategies which will create a compounding effect to their uh, portfolio. Because what was, I don't know, 3 4% in some strategies two years ago now can be 8 to 10. And so when you start you know, compounding your new allocation into these type of strategies, that can make up for the part of your portfolio, which itself you know, could be a little bit underwater as a consequence of those rising interest rates. You know, again, mm-hmm. credit, you know, real estate, what have you. So uh, that's the positive. You have to be able to to do that, right? So how do you do that? I mean, if you have effectively the denominators effect that people have been, you know, talking about, or you know, more liquidity constraint because cash is not coming back 
as quickly as you had anticipated because your managers cannot sell their portfolio or something else. The secondary market has been developing like crazy on the private equity, for example. As I said, private credit, you know, is another one. Real estate will be an obvious one, you know, given given the amount of uh, capital out there. And so it's about being prepared to say, okay, I've been making, you know, five, six, seven percent on this strategy. Maybe I will, you know, exit this strategy, albeit at a discount, you know, the lowest possible, mm -hmm. but the proceeds will be able to be generate, uh, reinvested into strategy that will generate a higher return, which over a short to medium time frame can make up, you know, for this uh, uh, cash flow requirement that I need for my pensioners or, you know, wh what have you. So I'm, I'm actually very optimistic that all asset owners, asset allocators, the one can be nimble. You know, it's a very exciting time ahead. Let's talk a little bit about how TKO champions impact investing. Obviously, the goal is to get to some sort of sustainable future. What's your investment thesis there? Yeah, I think we were relatively early in what has become a very mainstream strategy. You know, right, rightly so, um, and that was really in you know, a combination of uh, uh, many factors. We launched our very first growth equity, growth private equity uh, uh, strategy in 2017, 2018. Way before, you know, it has, as I said, you know, become, you know, a, a, a must-have strategy for many managers and for many um, allocators. We started doing that because in Europe, we've been investing alongside entrepreneurs, families. Um, as I said, we're not a buyout shop. You know, we don't take control. You know, we don't lever up company. We're trying to, you know, in our role of the middleman between the asset owners, you know, and the and the companies to allocate where we see, you know, the, a financial play, but an, an impactful financial play. So when we started this strategy in 1718 and started allocating capital, investing in entrepreneurs who had a solution that had to be massified. Because when you want to meet this target and these goals, you know, in terms of uh, uh, a climate of uh, CO2 you know, reduction, it's great to be investing in what will change in 20, by 2050, right. but it's more important to find what works today and needs to be massified. Uh, uh, scale up. You know, we're investing in profitable mid-market companies making 20, 25, 50 million EBDA and needed capital in. Those guys are not looking to sell their company. They need right. the capital in to scale. And we started doing that across low carbon mobility, across energy efficiencies uh, of the buildings. As you know, you know, it's 40% of the green gas emission. And so we started doing that, I would say, you know, naturally. Five years later, we now can, you know, represent effectively the case studies. You know, obviously the track record, it matters, but people want to understand what we're talking about when we're talking about this type of uh, uh, impact investing. Here it's about climate. We then launched, you know, regenerative agricultural, you know, strategy because one of the key objectives is how do you capture carbon and there's nothing like, you know, the soil and the ground, you know, to uh, mm -hmm. help do that. That's on the equity side. And then we started doing some private credit impact financing. What does that mean? You're a borrower. We're lending you some money at 5%. You're three times, you know, a BDA. We take all the uh, traditional credit metrics of a financial analysis. And then we add a third dimension. Uh, if you hit certain target, certain goals, extra financial goals, then you will improve your cost of funding. And your 5% coupon will go down to four if effectively you demonstrate that you reduce by, by X or Y or change you know, this uh, production process. And all of a sudden, you realize that if your cost of funding goes down, as a consequence of some extra financial goals being met, well, your return on equity goes up. Right. And so you can demonstrate that it's not about being a philanthropy. It's about, you know, making sure that we use the capital available to send it, you know, where it makes sense. And then all stakeholders, you know, uh, uh, benefit from it. And so as much as five years ago, uh, uh, it was um, nice to have. And once again, create, not compete. We're trying to mm -hmm. push that forward. Today, it, it's non-negotiable. It's not negotiable with our LPs. It's not negotiable with our customers, with our partners, with our banks, with our clients, with our staff, Barry. I mean, when we talk to uh, some of our 20-something, uh, 30-something uh, uh, colleagues, professionals, it's part of their um, commitment to the firm. Um, because one big issue, you know, in this, when it comes to this uh, impact and uh, 
uh, um, ESG, let's say, you know, in the wider sense. Um, at best, you can come across very opportunistic. Mm -hmm. At worst, you'll come across as fake. Mm -hmm. And in both situations, it's not good. And so, uh, us, you know, our colleagues, our staff, you know, people, and all the stakeholders, I mean, they are the guardians, uh, uh, they are the stewards of us, you know, being real here. So, uh, again, now it's no longer a nice to have, it's a must have, and it's, uh, uh, there's only one way. So ESG seems to have found a lot of support in Europe. Are you a little bit surprised about how this has become politicized in the U.S.? It seems like there are a group of people who are pushing back against impact investing, sustainable investing, not because of the returns, but they just don't like the politics of it. Yeah. I'm not surprised because, you know, and again, I'm an alien here, but, you know, I'm a, I try to be an observer, you know, of the dynamic of the... Uh, of the politics uh, here in the USA. Um, and we even experience that ourselves, you know, with some, um, some of our LPs uh, very often made up of um, uh, different boards, some uh, uh, teachers, firemen, policemen, you know, uh, um, uh, employees, you know, public, public servants, employees. And whilst we were dealing with uh, the same uh, counterparty, the same you know, pension fund, some of their constituents some of the underlying boards disagree on the approach to take there. So we've experienced that firsthand that within uh, uh, one given uh, investor, you know, asset owner, there could be some divergence. And very often now I can say because there was a bit of um, misunderstanding of what we were trying to do and what others, you know, are, are trying to do. So I'm hopeful that with a bit of education, you know, the science-based approach um, people will realize that uh, um, it, it's not a politi it shouldn't be a political game. I understand why. I'm not naive. I understand why. But I think the majority should prevail to understand that the asset owners today, the asset managers who can help them deploy you know, the capital, have an historical mission because we will be, uh, we'll be judged you know, 50 years down the, down the road. I mean, people will look back and say, you know, what did you do with the amount of capital that was available back then to effectively direct this capital to where, you know, to where it matters? So I'm trying to take, you know, this uh, perspective because effectively we've never been in an environment with so much cheap liquidity mm -hmm. that could be used purposely. So you talked about uh, ESG ratchets where people get better rates if they hit certain metrics. And you talked a little bit about agriculture, regenerative agriculture. Explain, for those of us not familiar with that, what is regenerative agriculture? What is the focus? What do you want to accomplish with it? Is it just carbon capture or is it more? It's the whole chain. I mean, it's the fact that, you know, uh, uh, soil goes without saying is a, is a scarce, you know, resource that needs to be uh, maintained in a way to be able, you know, to keep on producing in a way that... Uh, for the next generation, you don't look back and you leave, you know, uh, a brown soil uh, uh, full of, of you know, uh, fertilizer or, or, or others that will not be able to uh, uh, generate the same quality of product, you know, for the future generation at a time where you'll have to feed, you know, much more, you know, people. So the technique here, very similar to the... Uh, um, to the uh, climate approach, you know, we uh, we took you know five years ago, um, is really about finding entrepreneurs and the companies who have a solution for you know soil, you know, effectively a, a fertility, let's say, or some technique. You know, it's it's not really the agri tech as you may you know be be used to, but some some techniques have been proven um, and need this capital to scale, and this capital would not be available otherwise because it's not about you know buying land or acres of forest it's not about the agri-tech which is effectively uh, uh, um, uh, attracting a lot of uh, a lot of capital but these entrepreneurs uh, these uh, small cap businesses with a proven uh, concept and profitability and they need this capital you know to scale so you would be investing you know 20 30 percent taking you know 20 30 percent of the company investing this capital to effectively help scale the business to a size where then you can get to more 
you know, uh, banking financing, capital market, which, you know, is not, not that open. So it's this whole band. So it's certainly the case in Europe. We see it more and more here in the U.S. of this small mid-cap market that doesn't have, and even more so coming back to your comment about the uh, regional banks, you've got part of the financial market structure which is disappearing. And so you need the alternative source of capital. And so that's where, you know, we can be a very relevant tool. And that's, that's for the companies and the investors also want to allocate there. And you partnered with some really interesting companies on this, AXA, the big insurer, and Unilever, the consumer products company. What's their interest in this sort of sustainable investing? So um, one comment, you know, as an aside is, you know, at TKO, we've always partnered with, uh, or we try as much as we can to partner with the uh, corporates mm -hmm. uh, to bring uh, additional skill set. Um, we did that in energy transition, for example, with Total Energies very mm -hmm. early on, you know, 17, 18. Uh, we did that in the aerospace, cyber, with a, a bunch of uh, prominent European and global players such as, you know, Airbus, Dassault, Safran, Thales, bringing, you know, obviously some capital, but more importantly, you know, some skill sets, some knowledge, some reach, so that back to my create not compete we can tell a different you know a, a different story with uh, uh, with investors and as i and as as you just mentioned uh, the last one you know with unilever you know is the same um, is exactly the same approach which is bringing uh, additional expertise alongside an asset manager us financial investors and there's no shortage of capital as we said you know uh, out there in that case you know one of the largest european insurance company if not global and having you know together a different proposal fully aligned with some complementary with some complementary uh, sourcing to the um, uh, uh, to the uh, to the deal flow um, and here again, you know, at first people were maybe looking at us like, you know, why do you need to bring a corporate? You know, are there some conflict of interest involved here? And then a few years, you know, down the line, they're like, well, that's a very different proposal that we may have heard to, you know, from other uh, 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 managers. And there are plenty, you know, plenty of out there. Uh, uh, what's the conflict of interest if you're bringing in a consumer product to try and make food on a, in a more efficient, productive, sustainable way. Yeah, but that, that, that's my point. They, 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 they should be known and they are known. But, you know, there's, you know, people at times are a little bit uh, uh, reluctant or resistant, you know, to change. And so if that the is something... The status quo, it's, it's really powerful, isn't it? Voila. <laughs> I love this quote of yours. I have to ask you about this. The longer the happy hour, the harder the hangover. Explain. Very, very French. Yeah. <laughs> Well, that was, you know, I think that was um, at Milken, you know, at Milken Institute um, in May 22. And that's when the interest rates, you know, starting to raise. And um, I think I was telling you uh, 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 earlier, I was surprised to see that many people, you know, surprised because effectively the bar had been open for quite a long time um, with very, you know, very cheap liquidity, mm -hmm. if I may say, available. And um, going back to the financial crisis, the yes. entire period that followed was it's free exactly. booze for everyone. Yeah. Exactly, and that's you know that's ten years, if not uh, uh, if not more. And some of us, some of us, I think, had uh, effectively lost sight that liquidity should have a price, and credit you know has some value. And so effectively, uh, uh, this you know the, the, this comment I, I, I made was that yes, people are going to have a hangover of um, this mispriced, over-levered asset they may have bought, invested into, mm -hmm. as a consequence of this uh, free liquidity. So let's talk about perhaps uh, a mispriced asset class that was relying on free liquidity. As we're recording this, there is a recent Wall Street Journal headline, Company Insiders Made Millions Before the SPAC Bust. What are your uh, thoughts on the SPACs? special purpose investment vehicles. How do you uh, look at those? So we got into uh, uh, SPACs two years ago, um, hopefully not to follow the, 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 the herd, but because we saw there a very useful uh, 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 um, technology that could help some of our private companies, you know, that, that which is what we do, you know, the bulk of what we do, you know, is, is investing with private entrepreneurs, accessing the public market with the support of 
experienced manager, the operating partners, you know, with the, the support of uh, experienced, you know, financial players. And um, effectively, you know, we uh, very successfully, you know, uh, uh, unspacked, you know, some. We had, uh, we took uh, public on Euronext Amsterdam, a great company in the uh, 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 TV content production business, 3 billion turnover, wow. 600 million EBDA. Uh, it's called, you know, uh, FL Entertainment, great entrepreneur, Stefan Corby. It's a real company. Our SPAC is trading at, uh, I guess, you know, 10 bucks, you know, or around. Uh, real company. So the issue was not the SPAC as a technology. The issue was, you know, the type of company that were trying to access this market opportunistically and rightly so mm -hmm. in front of some capital that had been given to SPACs, promoters and managers. Remember that uh, interest rates were negative. So, you know, SPACs were used by some investors as you know, as a vault, you know, here's you know some cash. Getting five percent, right? exactly. I mean, I'll make up you know for the interest you know shortfall, and uh, I have the option you know to um, to opt out. So, uh, so, so it was a guaranteed higher yield. I won't say high yields, but higher yield bonds with an equity option at the end. If you like the equity company. You can stay with it. Saba Capital is one. A few others did the same thing. You know, the technology itself was, you know, excess of cash. You know, interest rates are at zero. I get negative uh, uh, cash, or, uh, negative uh, interest on my cash account. So here's the cash and I may opt out. What we tried to do in what we did uh, and some work, you know, although, you know, we decided to give back the capital because back to my skin in the game approach, the one we uh, decided to return the capital uh, um, that was last, you know, last month, uh, we um, had, you know, 150 million plus of our own capital committed to it. Mm -hmm. So rather than chasing, you know, the cheap option with the view of uh, hopefully making, you know, the uh, uh, the return embedded with the option, we're like first and foremost we're deploying our capital. The, opportunity is not there, you know, we're not going to deploy our capital for the sake of it. Th this comes back to skin in the game. When I you're a so. co-investor with I your LPs, so. you don't make dumb decisions because, hey, we have the cash, we might as well spend it. I think so. And uh, so uh, that was just, I think, a misuse of, a, of an interesting technique with some investors and a misuse of interesting techniques for the wrong company. So I read a piece recently, uh, a research piece that said, uh, Brexit may have taken as much as 5% off the total GDP of the United Kingdom. You worked in London. You're now in New York, uh, originally from, from Paris. Uh, does that sound realistic? What was the impact of Brexit on the UK? And, and who has stepped into the void that Brexit teed up? Yeah. Um, so first of all, that's a decision that was made, you know, by the by the British people, and uh, you know, I will not comment on uh, on the rational beyond that. I read the same uh, uh, studies, you know, uh, uh, that you mentioned, and every day I would talk to some France entrepreneurs in in Europe, uh, telling me how challenging it has become, when you know, just to move goods and things, right. you know, into uh, and just you know, trading, you know, with the UK. The one part I can comment on was um, the whole debate around the future of the city of London mm -hmm. as a preeminent financial place, global, but obviously, you know, European. What I can tell you, Barry, is, you know, since, you know, the world reopened and you can travel again, I'm actually going back more often to London than to Paris nowadays, mm. which is my, you know, the headquarter of my firm. Why that? Because London remains, you know, a, a critical business center, you know, for financial services. Um, there are some challenging associated with some some regulation, you know, you know, in the way you have to trade and why people and banks, you know, had to uh, uh, had to uh, open or, or, or export some branches onto the continent, um, and I understand why uh, and that you know uh, technicalities, but when it comes to uh, um, the cosmopolitan nature of London, attracting uh, um, uh, uh, global talents. Um, and as much as you know, I'm, I'm French, and Paris has been doing a tremendous job, you know, in attracting talent and firms, but the scale is such that uh, I wouldn't bet against uh, uh, London as a financial center. So uh, we have to um, uh, cope with uh, technical aspects, you know, regulation, cost of doing business for some has become uh, 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 very punitive if you don't mm -hmm. have the the scale, um, and that's why you know if I'm a bit you know 
selfish in the approach, we were fully equipped on the continent mm -hmm. to start with. We're now moving back more aggressively into London because we were less uh, uh, um, uh, overexposed. Uh, when many people are doing the contrary. You know, people are trying to uh, reduce their investment allocation to uh, the UK, their workforce in the UK. So we're trying to be a bit contrarian and taking advantage huh. of that. Huh. So people overreacted in one direction creates opportunities. Maybe. Um, uh, Europe is dealing with a war on, on its uh, eastern border. Uh, what has the Russian invasion of Ukraine done in terms of energy supplies and just the entire relationship of Europe with Russia? Well, it's, um, it's a complicated one. It's a very sad one because what I can tell you, Barry, is uh, uh, sitting here in the U.S. and, and when I talk to uh, friends, family over there, the perception of the war is very different uh, from one side uh, uh, to the, uh, of the pond to the, to the other because the reality that it's as we you know it's two hours away from uh, many of the uh, Western European capital, mm -hmm. and the uh, uh, the perception, the feeling with the population, you know, is very you know is very different. So, having said that, um, remember a year ago uh, uh, when the the, the 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 war started, obviously the concern about you know energy uh, independence, uh, sustainability was uh, uh, was front and center. Um, that was, a, I think, uh, the silver lining of the situation to put more uh, light and focus on accelerating, you know, part of the transition. Uh, and in itself, you know, that's a, uh, that, that was an encouraging step. Uh, looking backwards, you know, a year into or 18 months now, you know, into this situation, it's not as bad, I mean, quote unquote, on the energy side, um, which is a good news. But uh, the whole situation, you know, which I think we are unfortunately uh, stuck stuck with, you know, for a, a relatively long period of time, um, as creating a lot of uncertainty, you know, in the in the region and beyond. Um, but also, by the same token, a lot of um, political willingness, you know, to move to move quicker. And the response, if you remember, uh, that the European uh, government made uh, uh, right after the war. I mean, they made more progress in a matter of you know, a few weeks than we had only you know, in a few years. And so, mm -hmm. at times, it's uh, uh, it's effectively when the essential is at stake that people can react uh, constructively. So the concern, aside from all the humanitarian tragedy of the invasion, was oil prices would spike. It would eventually lead to recession in Europe. But a lot of Europe seems to have avoided that. What are your thoughts about greater Europe tipping into a recession? And pretty clear parts of Europe have slowed down dramatically because of the increased costs and, and dealing with the war. What, what does the environment in Europe look like to you? So n not dissimilar to what uh, uh, we're experiencing here in the U.S. and the re you know, of production capacity, we're seeing that in many uh, countries across Europe. Reindustrialization has been, you know, probably the most popular word of uh, politician, you know, lately. Mm -hmm. uh, not only because you need to demonstrate l l less dependency, you know, to outside market. The whole deglobalization, you know, theme. I think it was accelerating by this uh, whole situation. Um, and so for politicians, you know, it's a way to show, you know, a direction for the population. It's a new paradigm, a new software. And coming back to what we do for a living, you know, asset manager, it's a great frame in, you know, finding ways to allocate, reallocate, working with global investors to attract more capital in certain, you know, countries, you know, for certain industries. It's not happening overnight, but you can make it happen fairly quickly. Uh, uh, fairly quickly being, you know, a matter of months. If you've got all these stars aligned from the political direction, you know, to the, uh, uh, to the, to the population adhesion, uh, and then, you know, the, uh, uh, the capital allocation. And so if you, you know, I, I'm hopeful and I'm optimistic that that could be, uh, that could be the silver lining of the whole uh, 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 situation, as dramatic, you know, the, uh, 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 the situation can be. So you have offices in Asia, if we're deglobalizing to some degree, and China has been the big industrial driver of much of the world, what does it mean for investing in Asia generally, but more specifically, China? Yeah. So what we've been doing in uh, uh, in Asia, first out of Singapore, where we were uh, 
Um, we started um, uh, eight, nine years ago in Singapore. And then Korea and Japan, we don't have any presence in China, as a matter of fact. Um, and uh, uh, the, 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 the dialogue we had with these, tr- these investors locally was really about attracting them to some of our existing uh, strategies in Europe or uh, uh, in the US. Asia is, um, I have the chance, you know, to go uh, back there, you know, from time to time. And each time I'm there, I found, you know, uh, uh, local economies that have been, you know, uh, transformed. Uh, if you look at Singapore, what it was when we first moved there and, you know, eight years later, I mean, that's that, that's a global hub, like a global hub with all the consequences you're, you're reading every day, you know, the Bloomberg News, you know, the price of real estate and the numbers of family offices who moved from uh, Hong Kong, from part of the Middle East, you know, to open there for the very same reason that you have created, you know, a great talent hub, a very business friendly environment. You know, you've got the most sophisticated uh, sovereign wealth funds in the world. We were lucky enough, you know, to have Temasek backing us as early, you know, as uh, 2016. It's been a great partner ever since. Great place, you know, great marketplace. And so the way we look at our Singapore operations today, you know, we have a headquarter, Paris, and we have three global hubs, New York, London, Singapore. And out of these hubs, you know, then you can reach on a global basis, uh, first investors and effectively attracting them where we think there is an interesting investment proposal and also creating investment you know opportunities when you've got this supply demand imbalance again it all comes down to supply demand and how we can best take advantage of that hmm, really interesting so let's jump to our favorite questions that we ask all of our guests starting with what have you been uh, streaming these days what's been keeping you informed? and entertained, either podcasts or Netflix or, or whatever? Uh, one I like and I recommend, but because that's being produced by this company we backed that we took, uh, uh, we helped take you know public um, uh, a few months ago, is the Peaky Blinders. Mm-hmm. You know, that's great entertainment, you know, not only because I love you know this whole story about you know uh, the villain and the gangsters and all that, but uh, more importantly because that's great. Uh, Is content. that Netflix or Amazon? I it's think. a Netflix one. Mm-hmm. It's a Netflix one. I strongly recommend and produced by our friend at uh, FL Entertainment. Huh, really interesting. So, who were your mentors who helped to shape your career? So, um, few of them are. Uh, Senior people I worked for when I was a young analyst, you know, and uh, uh, an associate, because uh, every one of them, in their own, you know, different approach, um, helped me challenge the fact that we are going on our own, you know, at a relatively young age, you know, for this uh, uh, business. Uh, some of them telling us, well, it's either too late or too early for good mm-hmm. or bad reasons, and on the contrary, people saying uh, which was less the case in Europe than it can be the case here in the US, there's never a good time and you should give it a go, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, And so uh, many of them were finance professional, most of the time in investment banking, uh, and I, I, I still remain, you know, I still remain, you know, uh, friends. Some of them join us, by the way, mm-hmm. along the way, you know, at uh, uh, at TKO. Um, and there's that's one thing that uh, obviously was very valuable when you start your own mm-hmm. venture. What are some of your favorite books? What are you reading right now? So two books uh, I've started, um, very different. The first one um, I was uh, lucky to attend one of the again Mike Milken's, you know, event, you know. Uh, 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 recently, both in LA and then later on, and as you know, he's extremely focused on uh, healthcare, um, and uh, the whole focus is putting through uh, his institute and the uh, 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 all the uh, philanthropy around there. Um, and the book, um, you know, the book is called Faster Cures. Uh, accelerating the future of health, you know, by uh, by Mike Milken, mm-hmm. uh, is something which is fascinating because, you know, in our job day to day, you know, it's really you know short term. And when you step back a bit and you look a little bit of these demographic issues, you know, we touch base on some of those issues, you know, energy and all that. But the demographic is probably uh, 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 the most you know challenging one. And even if it's 50, 75 years from now, I think we should start. Factoring in, you know, many of that, you know, in, in, in today's decision, and the uh, uh, the other book, you know, more recent, I was uh, lucky to meet um, a French professor uh, in Boston who's a teacher both at HBS and HKS. She's been there, you know, for uh, uh, twenty years. You know, her name is uh, Julie Batilana, and the last book is called Power for All, 
And it's all about, you know, the relationship to, I wouldn't say even power, but if effectively power is about having an influence on making someone else change behavior, how it's not only top down and the way we may have learned it and how we should, with a new generation, in a new, uh, uh, in a new cycle, uh, and in the perspective of uh, things that are, you know, critical to me, which are, you know, democracy, but also capitalism, which is fueling many of that. How do you reconcile, you know, all that? And it's uh, worthwhile reading. Mm, sounds interesting. Our last two questions. What sort of advice would you give to a recent college graduate who is interested in a career in either private equity or investing? Well, I would uh, send him, you know, some of the mottos we're using every day at TKO Capital. Be curious. Think out of the box. Be on the ball. Think big. You know, I will share that with uh, uh, with them uh, because that's one thing that doesn't change. Technology may change, but you know, inter- interpersonal skill set and being being hungry. I think that's what matters. Huh. Interesting. And our final question: What do you know about the world of investing today? You wish you knew twenty five or so years ago when you were first getting started. Never take anything for granted. Thank you so much for being so generous with your time, Matthew. We have been speaking with Matthew Chevron, co-founder of TKO Capital. If you enjoy this conversation, well, be sure and check out any of the other 500 or so discussions we've had over the past eight or so years. You can find those at iTunes, Spotify, YouTube, wherever you find your favorite podcast. Sign up for my daily reading list at Ritholtz.com. Follow me on Twitter at Ritholtz. Follow all of the Bloomberg family of podcasts on Twitter at podcast. I would be remiss if I did not thank the crack team that helps put the conversations together each week. My audio engineer is Sebastian Escobar. My producer is Paris Wald. Atika Valbron is our project manager. Sean Russo is my head of research. I'm Barry Ritholtz. You've been listening to Masters in Business on Bloomberg Radio.